Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. On today's show, Matt Olene had a chance to visit with a very special guest. Coming up later on Prairie Pulse, we'll take a look at the beginnings of the Minnesota Farm Labor Party. But first, our guest is Dr. Bruce Pitts, now retired from Sanford Health, former chief medical officer there. And we're going to talk about some other things, though, that are interesting to our public TV viewers today. Uh, but first off, Dr. Pitts, just kind of tell folks a bit about yourself, your background, where you're from originally, and um, what you sure, do now. Sure. Well, I, uh, as you know, I'm a physician. I grew up in Rhode Island and trained in Philadelphia, which is a lot of where my interest in American history comes from. Uh, I've been out here for over 35 years and practiced uh, my entire career at uh, Merit Care and, and then been at Sanford. Um, I retired 18 months ago and uh, took on a new, a new passion. I, 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 I'm not really a historian by a long shot, but I uh, am doing historical time travel uh, through the eyes right now of Thomas Jefferson and this has taken me to other venues as well. Yeah, let, let's talk about your um, association with the Jefferson Hour and Clay Jenkinson, yeah, our good friend. Yeah, uh, how did that start? Well, Clay was, when I, uh, my wife and I planned to spend last winter in Paris, Clay asked if I would like to be the Paris correspondent for the Jefferson Hour. And he knew my interest in Jefferson and, and I said, sure, that sounds like fun. And that worked out quite well. And uh, we did a number of broadcasts from Paris last year, Jefferson's Paris and, and Paris Today. Um, I just got back from a trip uh, that recreated uh, Jefferson's travels through France in 1787. And we'll be broadcasting with Clay about that as well. So it, it's, it's really been a great uh, deal of fun. It's been very instructive. And it really has been time travel. It really, I really have been able to, to, to get into 18th century France in a way that I couldn't have otherwise. For people that don't know, how long was Jefferson in France? Jefferson was, in, was our ambassador to France for five years, 17, uh, 84 through 1789 mm. and uh, in 1787 he took a four-month trip around the country by himself. Wow. Now when you were there you discovered something I know we really want to get into that's, and that's right. an American that's right. cemetery you found there with a lot of North Dakota connections. And, that's right. Uh, tell us the name of the town where you found it and then what you found there. Well uh, Clay had asked me to find the monastery where Jefferson used to retreat uh, for periods of time and uh, it, was, it was hard to find, but it, it, it is in a place called Mont Valerien, outside in the suburbs of Paris. And it was known as Mont Calvary at his time. And uh, when I went there to find remnants of Jefferson's time, there were none. The monastery was long gone. Uh, there was a fort. Uh, there was a memorial to members of the French resistance that had been shot by the Nazis at that fort. And as we uh, uh, walked around, uh, we came to an American cemetery. Uh, the town is named Sorens, mm -hmm. and uh, the cemetery, like all American cemeteries, is, is, is quite beautiful. Um, they, they keep them up nicely there, don't they? They do. They yeah. do just a beautiful job. This is the smallest American cemetery in Europe. It's the only one that contains uh, soldiers from both World War I and World War II. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's some North Dakota connections there are. and Teddy there are. Roosevelt it was connections. It yeah. was an interesting, you know, I went there looking uh, to try to tap in a little bit to the spirituality that Jefferson, Jefferson must have experienced there. And we certainly did it at Sorens. Um, uh, we, 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 we wandered through the 1500 graves looking for people from North Dakota. And then we wandered into a little building off to the side. And uh, uh, it was a very small house, uh, two large folios, uh, two leather chairs. And in the folios were lists of all of the deceased who were buried at Sorens. Then a man came out, a bearded gentleman, tall, and said, can I help you? I said, yes, you can. We're looking for North Dakotans. He said, well, come on in. I'll, we'll, we'll find them. His name was Angelo Munsell, mm -hmm. and he found uh, the names of the 22 North Dakotans who were there. And we went uh, to either their graves or to the places where their names are inscribed if their bodies were not not available for, for, for burial. Um, and, and began to talk to Angelo for uh, three hours about um, what is happening now with these American cemeteries. And it turned out to be an incredibly moving experience. Uh, we're five or six generations out from these young men, in North Dakota's case, all men. There are also women buried there who died um, in World War I. Uh, and it's all, no longer all the North Dakotans are World War One. Yeah, at the cemetery. That's okay. right. Okay. All twenty-two. Okay. Um, uh, they uh, uh, died from a variety of causes, and Angelo said, "We we know why they died. We don't know anything about how they lived." 
And, and as these become less memorials and more museums, uh, they want very badly to curate the lives of the people who were buried there, to know more about how they lived. And, and this became, for me, a personal mission. I said, okay, Angelo, I have 22 names. That's, that's what I'm going to do. And so for the last few months, I've been doing everything I can to learn about uh, the 22 North Dakotans who are there, not only why they died and, and how they died, but also how they lived and, and what they were doing here before they left. And it's been an incredible journey. And how do you go about that? Have you contacted ancestors? Uh, how, I, uh, how has it been going so I, far? I, you know, it, it, I have been using documents so far. The North Dakota uh, NDSU archives has been incredibly helpful. Uh, there are books uh, that include the names of these people. Uh, there's Ancestry.com. There are a variety of sources that I have been able to use. Uh, they have the repository of all of the draft registration cards for all people who were inducted into the service during World War I. And that's just an incredible resource to find out where they lived, what they did, and, uh, um, and who they might be related to now. Uh, there was one, one, one man who, whose name was uh, uh, George Leslie Rourke who um, died in battle. He's one of the few who died in battle, actually. Many died mm -hmm. of disease. I know they did, yeah. Or drowning after sinking a ship. Right. Um, but uh, uh, George Leslie Rourke um, grew up uh, outside of Langdon. Uh, there are a lot of Rourkes still in Langdon and from Langdon. Everyone is familiar with James Rourke, who sure. developed the, the Rourke Art Gallery. That family has also done a marvelous job of creating a family tree. And so that, that probably is going to be the richest source of interviews that, that I will have as I move forward with this. And I just, I just was exploring that yesterday, so I haven't had, a time, haven't had time yet to uh, introduce myself to the works. And what are you going to do with the interviews? Are you going to publish a book? Uh, yeah, my intention is to, is to uh, publish a book. Um, I think there will be vignettes about a variety of individuals, so what they did, where they lived. Um, there, there are four Georges, and, and uh, it's fascinating how, how these people's lives uh, unfolded. There was, there was a, a, a George Boussalis who lived in Fargo. He was born in Greece, came to the United States with his family, uh, lived at number one, Eighth Street South, uh, with his mother and three brothers and two other Greek gentlemen, uh, ran a uh, fruit shop, and his brother ran a candy shop. Um, he was inducted and uh, never made it to France because the boat he was on uh, with three other North Dakotans was sunk in the British English Channel. Hmm. And so he drowned. Um, uh, another George uh, was George Peck. And George Peck uh, was a vulcanizer. He was a rubber that? producer. Okay. And I never had read about uh, a Vulcan. I knew a lot about Vulcans from Star Trek, but nothing about vulcanizing. And he ran a vulcanizing shop in Fargo, and uh, had and there's a lot about him in the record, about what he was doing before he was inducted. Um, he also never made it to France because he died of uh, influenza and pneumonia on the ship going over, along with three other North Dakotans. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a, a tragic story of, of disease as, as, and 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 uh, that took more lives than than uh, battle itself. And of course, at the end of that war, the pandemic. The worldwide pandemic That's hit, right. and I know that That's a lot right. of people think that that whole virus started in France. I don't mm -hmm. know. As a medical person, you probably know what I'm talking about. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. And 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 it 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 it, it the American Expeditionary Force uh, by the time the war ended had 1.9 million Americans in Europe, um, and they had 190,000 hospital beds that were always full. Yeah. And, and, and overflowing because of uh, the, the, the pandemic that affected not just soldiers, obviously, but the civilian population as well, and probably had a lot to do with, with ending the war when it ended. Uh, because both, uh, especially on, on the European side, the, uh, the Axis side, the, uh, uh, it, it really caused a huge crisis in, in Germany at that time. Mm -hmm. Now, I might be wrong, did you find a Roosevelt connection at yeah, the cemetery? This, this I know he, he lost a son in the war, I know he did. Yeah, he did. Yeah. I, I, uh, we, as I mentioned, we were going to um, Mount Valerien and Serenz looking for uh, Thomas Jefferson. When I was talking to Angelo, um, he mentioned that uh, um, at, at, at the time that World War I was, was the American presence there was gearing up and Americans were starting to die, there was huge pressure on the military to bring all of the American dead back to the States for, for internment here. Um, when Roosevelt's son, uh, Quentin, died. Quentin. I didn't know if it was Quentin or yeah, Archie, I couldn't it was, remember. It yeah. was Quentin okay. who died. Um, 
he announced that he was going to uh, bury Quentin in France, and that, and that, that Quentin would w have wanted to die with the people he was he was serving, and that caused a significant change in in the thinking of the American public to the point where, at the, in the end, about one third of the American dead from World War One were buried in Europe, and two thirds came back. Then Angelo just dropped. He said, "Oh, by the way, the Roosevelts used to own all that land over there." Wow. And what had been Mount Valeria, a religious retreat, um, uh, had a connection, another connection to Teddy Roosevelt. His brother, Elliot, um, was kind of a bad actor, mm -hmm. a bit of a drunk, mm -hmm. and uh, was married to a woman named, named Anna. And he had several little children, one of whom was named Eleanor. And in the late 18, 1880s, uh, he was sort of disgraced and went to Europe um, and wound up in an asylum in Sorens. His wife uh, rented land on Mount Valeria and then subsequently bought it. And it stayed within the Roosevelt family until the 1930s when it was given to the city to transform into a park. Huh. Um, so uh, running into uh, the story about uh, Teddy Roosevelt and his son Quentin and his brother Elliot and owning the land, I found a, a lot about Teddy Roosevelt, which was equally interesting to Clay, and and uh, and and much less about about Thomas Jefferson. But that's the nature of historical yeah. time travel. With real time travel, you don't always wind up where you think you're going to wind yeah. up. And of course, the Roosevelt connection to France continued because Ted Jr. was involved in the that's Normandy right. landings. Exactly. Very, he was not a spring chicken. That's right. When that happened. That's right. And, yeah. and that, 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 that's exactly right. And there are two Roosevelts buried in, mm -hmm. in Europe. Uh, yeah. One from World War One, one from World War Two. Why is this important right now, Bruce? One hundredth anniversary of the start. It's World War One. Sometimes is. people forget World War One more than World War Two. But why? Why is this important now to do um, this? It's important to me because of the uh, the human connection and and the importance of remembering those who gave their lives for uh, this country, regardless of the conflict, regardless of of, of why or, or when. Um, it's the hundredth anniversary. Uh, the anniversary will go on through uh, twenty eighteen. Uh, because it was a, a four or five year conflict. Um, and I think it's, 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 it's a good time for people to reflect upon uh, their heritage and the, and, and the sacrifices that their ancestors have made uh, for us. Uh, World War I does not have the, uh, the presence in our minds of World War II. That's probably just a generational thing. Um, the French actually see it as one war. Uh, yeah, and, I suppose. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, that never really ended. Um, so it's, 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 I think, interesting. I think it's, it has great emotional appeal. And the one thing I did come away with from Serenz was the very distinct feeling that uh, the serenity, the peace, the beauty that Jefferson found there continues to exist uh, at, this, at this cemetery. It's a lovely place. Now, Bruce, I know if people think they have connections to these people, do you please want them to do. contact please you, right? How can do. they contact you? Uh, Fargo Pitts at gmail.com. It's easy. Very yeah, easy. Yeah, yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. So that, uh, that that is the best way to get hold of me. And I've been in touch with a few people. Uh, this has actually turned up interesting connections. I, uh, there was a fellow who visited Serenz after I did. And uh, this Angelo said, well, if there's somebody else who's asking, has similar interests, maybe you want to contact him. And he contacted me. And it, it turns out that he grew up in North Dakota, even though he hasn't lived here for years. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, and so it's, you know, we get into more small little stories through these connections. But, um, you know, the names like uh, Barnick, uh, Busalis, uh, Rourke, uh, Peck, uh, Peck from Dickinson. I mean, there were just a variety. I have 22 names and people who I'm trying hard to research. And there's only one about whom I found nothing. Okay. So. And your research continues, right? My You're research continues, continue yeah. I spent a lot yeah. of time uh, going through old books and going through, I'm going to go down to the World War I Museum in Kansas City uh, and do some work in, in, in their resources. And I'm going to start contacting families uh, mm -hmm. to see what they remember and, and what they may have known. Okay. A couple more questions about Jefferson. Why mm -hmm. do you think he is still important today? And what is it about Clay's show that really resonates with people? Um, so much uh, in today's politics is attributed to the founders, and so much of that attribution is simply is wrong. false. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say you that. You can take a founder and you can twist them to any purpose whatsoever. <laughs> Plus, a, a person with the longevity of Thomas Jefferson changed over the course of their lives yeah. and said things at one time that maybe they had changed their mind about later. So it's easy to, to twist them to the views of, 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 of the moment. 
uh, I think what Clay does so beautifully is, is to get into the, the, the mind and heart of the historical Jefferson, uh, the, the real Jefferson, and how he might th reflect upon what's happening today, recognizing that he too would have changed or he's still alive. And I think he does that brilliantly, and I think it brings people back to a, a, a deep understanding of what uh, made this country what it is and what we need to continue to preserve in terms of uh, Jeffersonian ideals, Enlightenment ideals, uh, and also the, the, the ongoing conflict that represents democracy is. And there's a realism too, because if Clay makes a comment on his show about a current president or what Obama might have done or Clinton or Bush, he's he's done that through study of Jefferson's life. So his answers aren't just based on whim, they're based on research he's it, it done is, about what he might think he, of something. He is remarkable in terms of his grasp of Jefferson's thinking and his ability to immediately uh, contact in his own mind with, with, with quotes and, 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 and sources that uh, demonstrate what Jefferson would have said and thought. He's not living out his own agenda. Right. A couple minutes left, let me ask you about Sanford quickly. Mm -hmm. A lot of expansion going yes, on. Can you yes. talk about what this is gonna mean for the community in the region? You know, I think it's it, it's it, it's gonna mean a lot. Um, from a healthcare perspective, the, the new facilities are going to uh, uh, bring a much needed modernization to uh, the services that are available in, in in this region. Not only because of what it will provide to patients, but it's also incredibly attractive for recruiting doctors and nurses and scientists and the other the people that make a healthcare system go. So I think it it it's going to have a huge uh, impact on the quality of service, the availability of healthcare services uh, in this region. I think it's 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 very exciting. Is there you know when people need surgery or, or special really? It, it's pretty much covered here, isn't it? it I mean, is, there's some times where you might have to refer people to Mayo or yeah, whatever, but it, yeah, it's pretty, it, it, pretty there wide. Are very, yeah. There are very few conditions for which a referral uh, out of Fargo-Moorhead is, is needed. And of course, there are people that want it, and, mm -hmm. and we always support that. We, we encourage people, we want them to be comfortable with their care, whether it's here or elsewhere. But uh, the level of expertise that has evolved in this community is, is uh, phenomenal, something I'm very proud of. Mm -hmm. Uh, when, when are you going back to Europe next? Are you well, we just got trips? back. Okay. We just got back from a, a trip uh, that uh, recreated Jefferson's 1787 tour through France, and we'll be back in March and April in Paris, and uh, broadcasting uh, from there as well. Okay. You going to find any more cemeteries? You think, or I, you know, I, I think I will. I, I, I have a, a a whole litany of, of things that I didn't get done when I was there last winter uh, that I hope to get done this spring. What's the reaction of the French people to Jefferson? Or when you're there and they know what you're doing there, are they f familiar with him? Uh, As what, you might imagine, the... Uh, the French do not have a uniform response to anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, uh, that's what I love about him. <laughs> yeah. But there, there are sort of two, if you ask any French person to name one American president, they will name Jefferson. Really? They know that the, 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 he is the president that comes to mind. On the other hand, when Francois Hollande was, was in this country uh, last winter, visiting the United States and, and Obama took him to Monticello, the French were outraged that an African-American president would take a French president to see the home of a slave owner um, and because that's what they see. Right. And, and, and so, uh, like everything else, the French love controversy and uh, they even can make Jefferson controversial. <laughs> Interesting. Yes. Uh, about 30 seconds left. Uh -huh. Again, if people want to get a hold of you about the cemetery, their ancestors, uh, or also maybe you have a website for the Jefferson Hour, those two things the, as well. The website for the Jefferson Hour, I do have entries there, and that they would certainly forward those to me, and that's jeffersonhour.com. And mine is, again, fargopitts at gmail.com. Okay. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you. For being here. Pleasure. Dr. Bruce Pitts, the former chief medical officer at Sanford, now researching Jefferson Hour for Clay Jenkinson and finding cemeteries as well. Stay tuned for more. At the turn of the 20th century, Minnesota's entrenched Republican Party was challenged by the most successful radical third party in American history. From 1918 to 1944, the Farmer Labor Party was strong enough to wrest control of the state's government away from the entrenched political parties, profoundly transforming Minnesota's political climate. The Midwest had a one-party system because so many of these states were brought into the Union as Republican states, and that initial development of their parties 
meant that it was hard for any kind of other competition to grow up. And the Democratic Party basically had its stronghold in New York City and in east, northeastern cities and in the south. And uh, the rest of the country was a Republican stronghold. In a one-party system, voters, curiously, are not very loyal to the one party. There's something about competition that makes for partisan identification. And the lack of competition, of party competition, and the fact that the Republican Party didn't have to fight to build an electorate, meant that a large number of voters really were ready there for being picked up by people who wanted to start protest organizations, because these people weren't particularly loyal to the Republican Party. States are laboratories of democracy. That is to say that one of the great things about American federalism is that you can have experiments, policy experiments and political experiments and organizational uh, experiments. So there's a kind of dynamism and innovation that's built into American politics. And for me, that was really what was so fascinating about the Farmer Labor Party was it showed the, the possibility for dynamism and innovation that, that American federalism makes possible. Farming is a very insecure business. So that insecurity was something that farmers in the 19th century and in the 20th century until the 1930s were hoping to politically fix somehow. Workers didn't have protections. They didn't have protections for hours. And more important, they couldn't organize. They would get stomped on if they organized. So farmers were insecure. Workers were insecure in terms of their organizational rights. Or so it seemed to people because they were distant from banks and from cities and from what seemed to be the centers of, of financial and economic power. So they seemed to be essentially at the mercy of other people making big decisions about their lives. That created a context that was very favorable in Minnesota. Between the, the strength of the socialist trade unions and suddenly the emergence and the setting up of shop in St. Paul of the Nonpartisan League and then their organization out in the rural areas of Minnesota, the two basic kinds of economic insecurity created the potential for a coalition. In the 1920s and the 1930s, if you were an aspiring politician, there were only two places you wanted to go. You wanted to become a Republican or you wanted to become a farmer laborer there was a very talented socialist trade unionist who's completely obscure today, but was actually very important in the development of the Farmer Labor Party, a guy named William Mahoney. He was a person who threw himself into this idea that we ought to have an organization that would function between elections to keep the discussion going about what, what they're all about and to focus on how we're gonna get good candidates to run for the different positions. Then in the 30s, it really takes off as a third party, and it's really the most successful state-level third party we've ever had. And it's, a, in that sense, a unique political organization. And that's a going concern until 1938, when Harold Stassen takes over all the reasonable sections of the platform and just says, if you get me, you'll get a reasonable Republican who just happens to believe everything the farmer labor rights have stood for. But the party limped along. And then in 1944, decided that, yep, we're going to go and we'll, we'll, we'll move into the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party said, you come on over, we want you, because we're trying to build ourselves. The Democratic Party is now the new party. It's the strong party. And we want to bootstrap ourselves into getting the kind of strength in the electorate that Democratic parties are getting everywhere else. The reason that we don't have state-level third parties like the Farmer Labor Party is that the New Deal was a big success and it permanently strengthened the Democratic Party. I recognize that the many proclamations from state capitals and from Washington, the legislation, the treasury regulations and so forth, couched for the most part in banking and legal terms, ought to be explained for the benefit of the average citizen. All the prestige of doing good things in American politics moved over to the, to the Democratic Party, and so it's just very hard to um, start a plausible third-party organization. The Minnesota Farmer Labor Party's success, failure, it fails because it's not around, right? So we don't have farmer labor politicians. Success, it's a success in the sense that it created a political tradition and it's encoded in the name of the Democratic Farmer Labor Party. And to that extent, voters every, every election get reminded that they have a political tradition here in Minnesota that, that, that is uh, right there on the ballot in front of them. It created politicians 
who were more open-minded, I think, about social policy and certainly much more open to organized labor than Democratic Party politicians elsewhere in the country. Politicians who were heirs to the, to the kind of progressivism that, that the Farmer Labor Party tried to institutionalize and make permanent. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. for Minnesota Legacy Programs are provided by a grant from the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008 and by the members of Prairie Public.